So as most of you know, when I lived in California, I worked at In-N-Out for seven years. I've talked about this. It's a fast food restaurant. It's kind of like notorious because it's on the West Coast. But you may not know that at multiple points during that time period, I thought about quitting university just to work at In-N-Out. And part of it probably was because people at In-N-Out actually get paid very well. The managers get paid very well. And sometimes it can be a lot of fun. Maybe it was also partly because of the free burgers. Even though I don't eat meat right now, in those seven years, I ate more burgers than you will ever eat in your lifetime. Guarantee you. Uh, every time I worked, free burger. Might have been that. But honestly, what I think it was about was I found a tribe. I found a community at in and out It was like we had this shared common experience that only we understood. And so we would like eat literally and breathe our jobs. We would hang out together all the time outside of work. And whenever there was someone who would hang out with us who didn't work at In-N-Out, it was just kind of awkward for them because all we did was talk about work and it was like, we used this lingo and we were this, just this really tight knit community. And now I don't work there. And there's a couple of those friends that I talk to you maybe like once or twice a year, or we like check in, but we're not nearly as close because we don't have that that common experience anymore but we all want that we all need that to be known to be understood to belong to have people who are for us and with us and understand us we need community you might remember in one of my first sermons at reunion i referenced this book tribe by sebastian junger and he's a journalist who essentially in the book describes how veterans and even civilians who live through war and violence prefer war to peace because of the community that they find through the violence and all of the distress that they're going through. It's like he believes that the loss of closeness and the loss of community has some connection to the high rate of PTSD in war veterans. They lose that community that they found during the war. And I was listening to him in a podcast recently, and he says the people, that people are more comfortable in a close group with each other when they're facing difficult situations than they are individually in our culture that doesn't offer much uh, in the way of hardship or challenge. People are better off in community when they're facing difficult circumstances. But the reality is, like, in our culture, we are always tempted away from community. We are always enticed to care for our own needs first, to secure our comforts for ourselves, to think of our own career aspirations, even if it means stepping on other people to get to the top. We don't, we are encouraged to slow down and consider other people. I mean, the temptations honestly are so obvious, but then there are temptations that I think tempt us in, in even more subtle ways. Like one, this, this quest for, for authenticity, it's the people and the voices that encourage us to go and discover our most authentic self, to really discover our individuality, who we are, which often involves like emerging from the group. You have to do that in order to pave your own path, just do you. And the idea is that the, the group or the community actually holds you back from who you are becoming. Not to mention that if you are really trying to seek out this like individuality, this authenticity have you ever noticed that it's almost like you you actually become like everybody else like if you're so focused on being an individual person being different it's almost like you are just like everyone else trying to satisfy your desires with money and fame and ambition and comfort and you just end up looking like everybody else I see this temptation in, in other subtle ways, like this focus on self-care and self-improvement, which I believe is really important. But I think one thing that we all learned in the pandemic is that self-care is really hard when you're by yourself all the time. I put this, this quote in your notes from uh, Nikita Valerio. She said, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. We need more than self-care, we need community care and self-improvement actually happens in community. I was listening to this podcast recently with Joe Rogan and Russell Brand, and they talked a lot about community. And Joe Rogan said, quote, 
Self-improvement is about being better at what fulfills you the most, which is almost always establishing community. Self-improvement happens in community. The Bible is full of passages about community. In the book of John, which is a book all about Jesus, Jesus is praying to God for his followers. And he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, one. That's God's desire for us to be one. But in the culture that we live in, is there any real hope for Christian community? Like, could we actually achieve that? Do we really need Christian community or do we just need community? Like, could we get the same thing out, out of a book club or a sports group or uh, our coworkers? What, how is Christian community supposed to be different and can we actually achieve it? Well, to answer that, we're going to look at this passage from Galatians chapter 6. Uh, the book of Galatians was a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. So this is Paul. He was a church planter after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And what you have to know about the context is that within this community, this church, there were different kinds of Christians who lived their lives differently. They had different claims to status in the community. There were some who were Jewish and there were some who were not who were Gentiles, who had other culture and ethnic backgrounds. So you can imagine just the conflict that would come up in this diverse community. And after Paul uh, plants this church and kind of lays the foundation, there are people who come in and, and create some division by, by saying that you need to follow these different rules or, or do these different things in order to be a part of the community. So chapter six, verse one, Paul says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Okay, so like I said, the Bible says a lot about community, and actually this passage offers us a lot of different attributes of Christian community, gives us a picture of, of what it might look like, but I'm going to focus on two things here. And the first is is accountability. What Paul is really offering, I think, is the way Christian community stands out and how we work towards that. And part of this is accountability. But notice that he says you should restore a person gently. I know that we're often really uncomfortable with the idea of accountability. I've talked about this before, and that's because I think the church has done a really poor job of that. But I think essentially what Paul is saying here is someone else's failure, the hurt that they may cause, someone else who fails to, to follow the ways of Jesus, who fails to love God and love others, actually invites us to reflect on our own shortcomings. Can you imagine that? Accountability actually starts with humility. I think the church has done a really poor job of accountability because sometimes we do it without the understanding that everyone is actually pretty fragile. Like deep down inside, even the people who, who pretend to be super confident and they look like they have it all together, inside there's a fragile part of them. I included this, this poem that I love by Hafiz, a 14th century Persian poet. And in it, he says, admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you don't say this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. Still though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying, 
with that sweet moon language what every other eye in the world is dying to hear. Everyone is, is saying to someone else, love me. So do it gently. I mean, part of what Paul is saying is whatever behavior or motivation you're judging in someone else, whatever you're looking down upon could very much exist within you as well. We know this. It's like if you have a problem with how other people spend your money, maybe it's because you think a little bit too much about money. We see this with church leaders who preach so passionately against sexual immorality, and then we find out later that they had an affair or something like that. Accountability starts with humility. And yet we still like, I think we're still really uncomfortable with this word. We don't really like it. We don't like the idea of accountability, but you know what accountability really looks like? It's loving someone into being. It's loving someone into being. It's inviting them to live more fully in the freedom of God's love, the real freedom, not the freedom to do whatever you want, but the liberation from your impulses, from your desires, from your obsession with money or your unforgiveness or your fear. It's loving them into to freedom. And Paul doesn't really get into it here, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and get into it because you know, it's my last sermon, so fire me. Um, but <laughs> what I think accountability really, good accountability really looks like is how many of you have seen the movie Goodwill Hunting? Just remember that movie? Okay, so the movie is about a math genius who was an orphan. He was born in an under-resourced community, but he's a janitor at MIT. Okay, he's actually like an undiscovered math genius. And through a series of events, people start to find out how brilliant he is. And he has all of these job opportunities. But he's sitting with a friend of his from the community who's asking him about these job opportunities. And he tells them that he's going to turn them down says, no, I, I'm just going to stay here. Like I belong here. And his friend says to him, you don't owe it to yourself, but you owe it to me. He says, you know, the best part of my day is when I pull up to your house and I walk up to the door and I knock and I hope, and I think that maybe you won't be there because there's more for you somewhere else. He was loving him into being convicting him to do what was right for him. I think that's what accountability looks like. But we often like to pretend like our actions don't have consequences. Right? Like, like we just make actions in a vacuum. They don't have consequences when Paul says the exact opposite, like you reap what you sow here, right? We like to pretend like our actions don't affect anyone else. Like, why am I going to critique anyone else's behavior? Like, that's their life. That's up to them. Don't tell me how to live my life. Like, it's my life. But let me ask you this. If you were to eat at a chain restaurant, okay, uh, Swiss Chalet, whatever it is, and you get terrible service, like someone's like texting while they're taking their order, their, your order, they're so rude. And then you get your food and it's undercooked and there's a hair in it and you go to take it back and they don't give you a refund and it takes them forever to actually get, to actually get you your food. And by that time, your whole family and friends have already eaten. Are you gonna go back there? Maybe not for a long time. Or, or what if you have, uh, what if it's a retail store? You have like a pretty woman moment, right? They like just treat you horribly. Are you going to go back and shop at that store? No, you're going to go to another store and then you're going to go rub it in their face that you spent all your money somewhere else. Why do we expect it to be any different with church community? Like our actions as representation of Jesus and of the church have consequences and affect people's perception of the church. You know, right now there are so many things that we can critique about the church. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to do that. We need to, to call the church to be better, to be a more authentic representation of Jesus's love. But this is my question. Are you gonna be a part of the solution? Can we love other people into being? Don't just critique and abandon the church and stand at a distance and tell it how to be better, journey with it and be a part of the solution. Last week, I talked about how mission is not about just what you do, but who you are. That doesn't uh, just apply to an individual level. It applies at a communal level as well. Like mission is about being collectively together. We are the light of the world. 
and our actions affect our witness. I think part of what Paul describes in this letter is how the death and resurrection of Jesus and the power of the spirit of God's personal presence empowers us to be a better witness of Jesus. Because in the freedom that we have in Christ, we can own our own shortcomings. We can acknowledge them. We can recognize it within ourselves. We can confess. We can love other people into being. We don't need to live comparatively because God's love is for all of us. Jesus is inviting us to journey with the church to help it be a more authentic witness of who Jesus is. Okay, so the first thing I think Paul describes in this passage is, is accountability, but, but he also talks about burdens, about carrying one another's burdens. So let me just com be completely honest with you. There are plenty of passages I could have picked to talk about community, but I picked this one because of that verse, because I honestly believe that if you want Christian community, if you want deep, authentic, meaningful, fulfilling relationships, if you want relationships that stretch towards eternity and don't just end when you get another job or you no longer have that thing in common, this is how you get it. By bearing each other's burdens. But unfortunately, many of us never get there because we don't know in Western culture how to go the distance with people. Like especially in Western culture, the church and people struggle with this. We're not very good at bearing burdens. You know what we're very good at? We're really good at lightening the load, okay? It's like, we see a problem, all right, we'll, we'll give some money to that. We'll post something on social media. We'll send an encouraging word. We'll say a prayer. But do we bear the burden? Like, do we help other people carry theirs? Do we get close enough to the suffering to touch it, to feel it? And not just for a moment, but for the long-term journey. Paul says, bear each, other burden, bear each other's burdens, don't just lighten the load. So, so what does Paul actually mean by, by burden? Like that, that word is pretty all-encompassing. It could cover a number of things. And of course we have to consider the context of the rest of the letter. But I'm just gonna say, I think Paul's alluding to a couple things here. First of all, there are burdens that people carry that are completely out of their control. Right? This is called systematic injustice. This is called being born into poverty. This is called illness. This is called the place that you are born. I mean, look at the rest of the world right now and how the pandemic is affecting them. Some people have heavier burdens than other people. We are very fortunate right now to be living in Canada where we can get a COVID test for free. So part of the burden that Paul is talking about is, is those burdens that are out of people's control. Some people just have a heavier load. And part of what Paul is saying is like, walk with them, help them carry it, make their load lighter. I also think Paul is talking about other people's mistakes, their sin, the choices that they make that hurt other people because people are messy. We're gonna get it wrong. Our own stuff comes up. We say the wrong thing in the moment. And I think this is what Paul is talking about here. Like relationships are messy. You're going to get it wrong, right? We're living in the spirit. We're not trying to follow all the, all the perfect rules and guidelines. But stick it out because it's worth it. Don't just walk away because it's uncomfortable. It's costly to love people and embrace the cost. Now, quick caveat here. There are times where it's very appropriate and necessary to walk away from a, a relationship, whether it be abuse or it's just toxic patterns within something you keep getting hurt and maybe you need to reassess like how much safety there is in this relationship or how much trust this other person is worthy of. So yes, that's absolutely necessary. And I think in our culture, we walk away from relationships far too easy. Paul's saying it's costly to love people. So love those and make room for those who are inconvenient and costly to love. There was this woman in my neighborhood. She was the mother of a couple of the teenagers that I was pastoring. And she asked me to go to a court hearing with her. Let me tell you, I had been working alongside the justice system for four years, but that was one of the most stressful experiences I've ever been in. We go into this courtroom that is packed with people. And about seven minutes before the judge calls her name, 
the public defender who we had never met pulls us outside reads the police report and if you've ever read a police report they are very unemotional matter of fact and she doesn't have the time to process the emotion that's coming up in her or the fact that there are things within this police report that didn't actually happen the way that it's described so the public defender says to her okay so what do you want to do and she looks at me and I'm like, I have no idea. And she has no idea. And so he like just gives us advice. We go back in there. The judge calls her up. She says her thing. We go to the court clerk and then we find out she has other open charges. Love those and make room for those who are inconvenient and costly to love. Because if you think it's inconvenient for you, if you think it's costly for you, imagine what it's like for them. That's what I kept thinking. I'm, I felt so overwhelmed by this whole process and what she was going through. And I was thinking, oh man, imagine what this, like, this is like for her, who's actually carrying this burden. If you think it's inconvenient and costly for you, imagine what it's like for them. Paul says, carry each, other burden, carry each other's burdens, let them into your home, let them into your heart, welcome them all the way in so that they can be redeemed and ultimately transformed and you can too. See, the irony is when you completely give yourself over to community in this way, when you bear the burdens of other people rather than just trying to lighten the load and you let people in, that's when you die to yourself. That's when you lose yourself and that's when you really find your most authentic self. You can't discover who you are outside of community. Community in God's kingdom in the world that he is making, it's different than community in the rest of the world. Because in God's community, you have unity and diversity. You have people showing you over and over again how worthy you all are of love, calling you into more, calling you into being. It's a testament of God's faithfulness in Jesus to you. It's like imagine the worst moment of your life and people walking with you saying, this isn't too much for me. This isn't too much for me. I'm here with you. In God's world and his kingdom, we have community like you can't find in the rest of the world because we are unified in the only thing that binds people together for eternity, and that's Jesus. You don't lose the community when you go find another job or you become a different person. I think this is the community that we really long for. We really long for the, the comfort of community, but if we're being honest, we're uncomfortable with the cost. Like we dream of diversity, but we don't want to deal with disagreement. We long for loyal relationships that last, but the thought of the long game and commitment, all that makes us squirm. We talk about peace, but we often settle for being polite and politically correct. We need applause and affirmation. We need someone to cheer us on, but we reject any kind of accountability. We hunger for income intimacy but we refuse to be inconvenienced don't mess with my schedule or my plans or my self-care or what i have going on for me we see the value but we shy away from being vulnerable this is my question for you you want the benefit of community are you going to bear the burden are you going to embrace the cost I've become more convinced than ever during this pandemic that hell is actually isolation. Isolation from God and other people. I was already pretty convinced of that before the pandemic. But there's this line in the Apostles' Creed, which is this concise statement that earlier, uh, the early church came up with to describe what it looks like to follow Jesus, what they believe. There's this line that says, he descended into hell. And when I look at the crucifixion, when I look at Jesus on the cross, I see someone alone betrayed, entering into ultimate isolation, which is death, so that we would never be alone to rescue us from the isolating power of sin, to bring us into redemptive community. And ultimately, so we could follow in his footsteps, so we could bear other people's burdens and let other people bear ours, because that's what Jesus did. He took on our burdens and allowed other people to carry his. Remember, someone carried his cross because he couldn't. Like, let's just be honest. It cost Jesus a lot to be in relationship with us. It cost him his life. 
And the people, they didn't kill Jesus because he was lightening the load, because he was donating money or posting something on social media or just praying they killed him because he let people in. He got really close to their suffering. He wept over it. He stayed in their house. He ate dinner with them. That's why they killed him. And that's where you find everlasting community. And that's where you find yourself. There's this famous quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a, a Christian who ended up in prison for resisting Nazi oppression. He said, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. It's like the idea that we have this, uh, this, ideal, this idealized vision of community and we expect that, but we don't really want to bear the cost. Some of you who have been following Jesus may know what God wants for you. Some of you who are newer to your faith may not be sure what God wants for you. Let me assure that God, what God really wants for you is community. To experience his love and community with other people. And that kind of community that is bound together in Christ, that bear one another, bears each other's burdens, I think that's honestly our most powerful witness as followers of Jesus. Greg Boyle, I've talked about him a lot. He is a, a Catholic priest, the founder of Homeboy Industries, which is a gang rehabilitation program in LA. Basically, he helps people who are getting out of gangs get jobs so that they can stay out of gangs and stay away from prison. But he says the kinship the community, the relationships, the shalom, the peace between people is actually way more important than the jobs and the success. Sure, the jobs and the success, that sounds really impressive that he's helping people leave gangs and get jobs. But you know what sounds even more impressive, more incredible and remarkable? In one of his books, he describes uh, this story, he, this conversation that he was having with one of the men in the program. And he asked him, what'd you do on Christmas? This man was an orphan, abandoned, abused by his parents and worked uh, in their graffiti crew. Uh, and he said, oh, I was, just, I was just here. And Greg said, alone? And he said, no, I invited six other guys from the graffiti, graffiti crew who didn't have a place to go. And uh, yeah, he names them off and Greg realizes that they were like all enemies of each other. <laughs> They're all from rival gangs. And Greg said, what'd you do? Well, you're not gonna believe it. He said, we baked a turkey. And we ate it together. Can you imagine that? Members of rival gangs who were like killing each other, sitting down at a table and eating turkey on Christmas. Do you think that that was easy? No way. There's no doubt in my mind that that was extremely costly and hard and probably awkward. There's a lot of conversations to work, for, work through there. but you're not gonna find community like that anywhere else. This is the perfect time uh, to check out of church, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the end of the pandemic, it's summer, your pastor's leaving. This is a perfect time to walk away from Christian community. You can listen to sermons on your podcast. Uh, do you really need community? Let me tell you that uh, my most painful hurt, my worst betrayal, it took place in church community. But so did my most profound healing and my deepest sense of fulfillment. So let me just say this to you, risk it, risk it. Bear the cost, it's worth it. Don't just lighten the load, bear the burden, be vulnerable, let people in, love one another into being, journey with each other into deeper, holiness get saltier be an incredible witness to people around you don't let the voices within our culture lead you astray convince you to pursue the next best thing to let you believe that there's something better out there for you if you pursue it on your own if you pursue your own interests let the faithfulness let your faithfulness to others your commitment to community the way that you bear the cost be the most powerful witness to who Jesus is, to what Jesus did for us. Don't walk away. Risk it. Lean in. Go deeper. Let that be your witness. Let me just say a prayer for us. God, thank you for uh, 
God, the way that you loved us into being and loved us into community and continue to love us through other people. And God, even though like everyone around us, all of the voices within our culture, all of the patterns set up for us in the world that we live in leads us away from community tells us it's better to pursue things on our own, to, to worry about ourselves first and our needs and what's comfortable. God, would you just lead us into the only, only community that you can create? And God, would you just like thrust the burdens of others upon us so that we can find out what it truly means to follow you and to be like you. I pray these things in your name. Amen. We continue to practice communion together as a way of uh, just remembering what Jesus has done for us. This was a uh, representation or symbolic of Jesus' last meal with his friends before he died. And I read somewhere that Greg Boyle, he said, Jesus doesn't lose any sleep that we will forget that communion is sacred. He is anxious that we might forget that it's ordinary. It's a meal shared among friends. That is the incarnation. So I, I so wish on this last Sunday that we could just have a meal together. And, and that would be our communion and our community representation of God's work in this world. Um, but since we can't do that, will you just join me in taking communion? This is the body of Christ that was given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. I think I am passing it over to Nancy, who is going to jump in here with a few words and a prayer. Morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. And um, <clears throat> as we've been saying all morning, this is uh, Grace's last official Sunday with us. And so we want to make sure that we, we recognize that. Um, we say a few words of thanks and um, that we send her off with our blessing and prayer. So we're doing that both this morning and tomorrow night um, because we know some people can't do both. But if you can do both, that's, that's great. You know, I said to Grace this week, sometimes um, when somebody is leaving a church, you don't always remember all the things that they've said, but you often remember the last thing they said. And Grace, um, uh, God really spoke through you this morning. And I think it's something for us as a community for us to really hang on to and to take that into the next season when we start to meet together again, uh, when we look for another leader who will come, um, that we're going to be the kind of community that will risk it, you know? And I always think of, you know, what, what is missional impact? How, how do we know that a, a church is making a difference? And I think, uh, Grace, you opened scripture to us in a new way this morning for us to understand that as we go deeper with Jesus, we're going to automatically, out of the flow of that, go deeper with people. And wouldn't that be incredible if that was our reputation as Reunion Oakville? This group of people knows how to bear people's burdens, walk with people in such a way that people are appointed to Jesus and they learn about his love. So thank you, Grace, for listening to God to give us this sermon. Um, I think it's something that we're going to really treasure. And we're always going to remember that you gave to us, especially um, this morning. When I was sitting here this morning, I was thinking of some characteristics of Grace. Grace has been staying with us for the last, how many weeks it is? Six weeks of celery. <laughs> And uh, Mikhail was here with us for one of those weeks, and he was talking about secondhand celery smoke, that he was concerned that maybe if he was around too much celery, he may have a problem. So um, <clears throat> we, we've enjoyed that. 
but I, I actually just jotted down some characteristics of you, Grace, and um, it didn't sort of take any time. It just sort of came off my pen. And so these are the things that we recognize that God has put in you. And in all of these things, we have been greatly impacted by these things that God has put in you. So I said, Grace is a woman of prayer. Um, she listens to God. And out of that, she loves God and loves others. Uh, Grace brings a fresh perspective in scripture. I think a lot of us have said, I've never seen that in that verse before, after she has taught. And that's something, Grace, that we've really um, benefited from and grown from. And you've encouraged us to, to look at those fresh perspectives in the scripture. You obviously have a teaching gift. And today was a great example of that. Um, Grace is really great. Grace, you've been really great at one-on-one -on -one building uh, relationships and COVID sort of forced you even more to have to do that, but you, you did that in a really good way. And you took a real interest in our stories. And many times when Grace and I were having a Zoom coffee, she'd always say at the end, can we pray? You know, and what a great reminder that we get to do that with each other. We're, we're, we're allowed to do that. It's one of the things we get to do. And Grace, you really modeled that uh, um, to us. You taught us a lot about spiritual disciplines and how Practicing those things are some of the tools to help us go deeper with Jesus. You are a joyful person. Uh, I can tell you, Grace is a, a cup half full kind of a person. And she comes back from a walk and she's seen a blackberry or a bird or a bunny rabbit or something. <laughs> and you hear about it. Yesterday, she went for a walk and told us about all the people she saw in the backyard, what they were doing. So, um, she went to someone else's engagement party <laughs> while she was going on a walk. <laughs> and anyways, um, I think that's evidence of your joy and your joy in um, God's world and God's people. Grace, you have a heart for justice and peace. And I think that's one thing that we didn't get to see fully lived out because of the restrictions of COVID, but you certainly encouraged us um, in that area. And you really want Christians and churches to be missional and uh, you've spoken in, into our life that way. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and, I, and then I wrote down celery and watermelon. <laughs> and, uh, but that is um, evidence though of the sad part of your story is that you have been ill and um, we're sorry that this has been a tough year for you um, as far as your health is concerned and we know that serving us has probably brought some sacrifices in that area and so as we pray for you this morning um, thanking God for these things and many others that I didn't list uh, we, we want you to know that we'll be pray, praying for your health and that you'll be restored to health and uh, be ready for the next thing that God has for you so thank you for being you uh, thank you for being the, the first female reunion pastor <laughs> Um, we're proud of you for that and thank you for coming to us and uh, for speaking to us as you've listened to God. So let's pray for grace together as community. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the God that you are. Uh, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we're in awe of you. Uh, there's never a day that there isn't something that we can be in awe of you for. And thank you for being that God, that Father, um, that can unite us. Lord, we thank you for bringing people into our life, leaders into our life, uh, community members into our life. And we thank you, Lord, for that day uh, a year ago, November, when grace became a part of our community. Lord, we thank you for bringing her to us. Uh, we thank you for her, her obedience in listening to come and to leave home and country and to come to this uh, crazy Canadian life here. And Lord, we thank you for the things that we have mentioned that have been evidence of your presence in her life and the transformation that you do and keep doing and how she shares that with us um, and has done that as a pastor 
and as a friend and as a colleague. And Lord, we pray that you would go with her as she travels in a couple of weeks. Uh, we pray that you would fill her with hope and continually giving her that joy that she exudes um, so easily. We pray for her health and well being that this would be a summer of restoration for her. And in that restoration, she would know your presence and your blessing and your hope for what you have next for her. So Lord, we pray that your face would shine upon her. We pray that your love would fill her and that your grace would surround her and that you uh, will be all that she needs. Lord, we are gonna miss her and uh, we know that we're gonna be on a journey for uh, someone else who will come to teach us and lead us and we pray um, for that process as well. So we thank you for this morning. Lord, help us to remember Grace's words as words from you and to um, allow them to be, to take root in our life as individuals and as a, a church community. We love you and we pray your blessing on Grace and for each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Nancy. I wasn't expecting that, so thank you very much. Um, I also have a blessing for all of you, so <laughs> I'm just going to bless you now. Um, reunion, it has been just such a great pleasure and honor to pastor you and to get to know all of you, even in this season. I'm really thankful for the way that you welcomed me in, many of you into your home for a long period of time. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Let me just send you with this blessing. To God be the glory and to the earth be peace. And to you, reunion, strength. Strength to bear the burden and to risk it. Even though there's a cost to community, it's worth it. So don't just lighten the load, bear the burden, be vulnerable, let people in, let people help you love one another into being journey with each other deeper into holiness get saltier be a witness and be the may the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you now and forever amen <laughs>